Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. Um, I'm Ernest Morrell. I'm the Associate Dean for the Humanities at the College of Arts and Letters here in Notre Dame. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth event in Ahead of the Game. This is a lecture series I'll be having for all of our home games where we invite our star faculty from around the college um, to present lectures. So we'll be hearing from faculty members. This will be the fourth. We'll have one before the North Carolina game, Navy game, the Georgia Tech game. Uh, who will tell us about their research in really accessible and creative ways. Uh, before we get started and introduce our speaker, uh, I'd like to thank our colleagues in the Department of Sacred Music um, for loaning us this amazing lecture hall um, that we've been able to um, have our series in this semester. I'd also like to thank um, our folks in the Dean's Office who've helped, our student assistant Emily Hannon, um, Jenny Peterson, Megan Steiner, uh, who are in the back and employee nature are not here. They're all senior uh, administrative coordinators in the college, and they work with our speakers, the communications office, and many others uh, to make this event happen. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, um, Professor O'Donnell Forreston, the Reverend Thomas J. McDonough, CSC Associate Professor of Film, Television, and Theater. Uh, Dr. Forreston has received numerous awards and honors for her research in African American theater, including the Mid America Theater Conference's Robert A. Shanky Theater Research Award and ASTR's Oscar G. Broadcast Essay Prize. Her second monograph, Sisters in the Struggle, an Oral History of the Black Arts Movement, Theater and Performance, is a finalist for the Association for Theater in Higher Education 2021 Outstanding Book Award. However, um, Dr. Forrestrin considers raising four really awesome children her most outstanding achievement. Um, she's not working on her third book project. Uh, she spends her time playing Minecraft with her children, baking unhealthy desserts, <laughs> and binge watching the television show Survivor. Is that so true? Yeah, so true. It's still Survivor? Yes, that's, all in. That's hardcore. That is hardcore. <laughs> um, Professor Forrestrin's talk today is Black Girl Fairy Tales on the Musical Stage. Um, during the 1970s, Feminists launched critical debates about the influence of fairy tales, positioning the promise of happily ever after within the larger cultural and political struggle for gender equality. Unfortunately, these studies and those followed rarely consider fairy tales created by black women or the sociopolitical meaning garnered from their works. Professor Forgren's analysis of the Tony Award winning Once on This Island and the less studied but popular musicals the liberation of Mother Goose, and the other Cinderella intervenes within these broader conversations, staking a claim to black girl musical fairy tales as a site of transgressive possibility. And I just have to say, um, LaDonna is one of the rock stars of our college. Um, we are super, super excited and privileged to have her as a colleague. So please join me in welcoming Professor LaDonna for us. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. And just good afternoon, everyone. I was told that I could expect anywhere between 10 and 100 people in the audience. So you are special to me, each and every one of you. OK, so it's a pleasure to speak to you today about a project that is very near and dear to my heart, black girlhood, uh, black girl fairy tales on the musical stage. So honestly, I can't remember a time when I was not enthralled by stories of magic, transformation, and good conquering evil. Cinderella tales in particular appealed to my young sensibilities. Having been raised by a single mother, constantly surrounded by nine unruly sisters, and living below the poverty line, I naturally connected with tales that featured persecuted heroines, uh, reversals of fortune, and unkind siblings. My imagination allowed me to escape everyday violence that was around me and experience the protection of a loving fairy godmother, the pleasure of a beautiful gown, and the ability to defeat, to defeat my more powerful foes, which often took the form of my older sisters, seen here in exhibit A and B. They are up to no good. My experiential knowledge of black girlhood, navigating violence and early encounters with fairy tales shape every aspect of my research, including what I am going to share with you today. Rather than discuss my entire book project, which would keep us all here until tomorrow's game, I'm going to focus on three major points. 
that went too far. There we go, three major points. The need to reclaim the works of black women musical theater artists, the importance of centering black girlhood, and why Jackie Taylor's The Other Cinderella, a musical written more than 40 years ago, continues to matter. So, reclamation. Elizabeth Davenport isn't a name that most musical theater lovers would ever recognize. Yet, my earliest memories are of listening to my mother tell stories about her talent, her drive, and the racial barriers that effectively limited her theatrical career. Under the tutelage of her mother, Helen Thomas, she and her younger sisters, Naomi, Beverly, and Dorothy, performed the Thomas Sisters Violin and Vocal Quartet, and they performed throughout black churches and events in Mahoning Valley in Youngstown, Ohio. During the 1960s, she began a solo career on the musical stage, performing in numerous productions at the Youngstown Playhouse, one of the oldest continuously running community theaters in the United States. Although her beauty and her melodious soprano voice filled auditoriums, she could not breach institutional white racism and remained confined to supporting roles throughout her career. She financially supported herself, her daughter, and her mother by single-handedly running a convent kitchen. During the day as she prepared food for nuns, Richard Rogers and Oscar Hammerstein's masterpieces were never too far from her lips. In the evenings, she attended audition after audition to make her vision of a life on Broadway a reality. When she died in an automobile accident at the age of 52, she had never given up her dreams. My great aunt Elizabeth stands among countless numbers of unheralded young and gifted black girls who contributed to the proliferation of musical theater. While I did not inherit this musical talent, I will not sing for you today, I grew up with a deep appreciation for black women's musical genius and continue to share this knowledge with my 12-year-old daughter, Piper. Their works became even more meaningful to us as a global pandemic raged on and the call to value and protect black life reached international audiences. As public schools and universities pivoted to online learning during the spring and fall of 2020, any semblance of normalcy in my household evaporated. Seen here with exhibit C. Musical theater showdowns, and yes, now we've added a, a second dog to the mix. Um, musical theater showdowns became our new norm. The showdowns were simple. Piper blasts a song from one of her favorite musicals at any point in a given day. We sing along, loudly, badly. After our screeching concludes, we debate the merits of the songs. The lyrical composition, the tempo, the emotional resonance. And finally, I tried to best my daughter's choice, blasting a cast album drawn from this very study. We repeat until I log in to teach an online course or her virtual classes begin. These seemingly inconsequential musical theater interludes bring much needed joy and laughter into my daughter's life as feelings of fear, anxiety, and uncertainty encircle our lives. Our lively showdowns also provided an opportunity to enrich my daughter's understanding of how our family history relates to a broader discussions of black women's musical performance and activist traditions. Prior to our showdowns, Piper's knowledge of musical theater consisted of canonical musicals and more recent mega hits such as Hamilton, Dear Evan Hansen, and Beetlejuice. As I shared our musical theater heritage with Piper, I discussed how the barriers that prevented Green on Elizabeth from achieving her dream persist today. Contemporary black women theater artists continue the longstanding tradition of using the seemingly escapist platform of musical theater to foster a more just and equitable society. By contemporary, I refer to the periodization following the Civil Rights Act of 1964, spanning from 1970 to about 2020. While the US government has extended civil liberties since the 1960s, with the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, the Marriage or Same-Sex Act of 2013, we have yet to eradicate systemic racism, sexism, ableism, heterosexism, and other oppressive forces from our stages and in greater society. Now I'm saying all of this to my 12-year-old daughter. So as her eyes begin to glaze over, because every tween enjoys a long-winded history lesson, I introduced her to Kirsten Childs' off-Broadway musical, The Bubbly Black Girl Sheds Her Chameleon Skin. 
and I specifically introduced her to the song Chitty, Sweet Chitty Chatty. Try saying that three times fast. So I'm going to play a sample of it for you. It's about a minute long. Hopefully it's not too loud, but this is the song that I played for her. you caught that lyric that it goes from this upbeat tempo and you almost want to like clap along, right? And then watch out for the bomb now. Did you catch that? So my daughter's immediate response to the song Sweet Chitty Chatty was, wait, what? Did a girl just die? This seemingly innocuous upbeat song sung by an elementary school age black girl and her to her talking dolls delves into the 1963 bombing of the Birmingham 16th Street Baptist Church. This act of white supremacist terrorism killed four black girls, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. After we analyzed the song's engagement with black girlhood and the history of white terrorism, again, she's 12, I'm doing this, um, Piper summarized Child's award-winning work with the age-old wisdom of a generation zeer. Quote, deep meanings, but happy tunes, end quote. I love quoting my daughter. Okay, indeed, Childs explained during our 2021 interview that she crafted the bubbly black girl sheds her chameleon skin to provide three-dimensional images of black people, especially black girls on stage. And she said, quote, the most important thing I wanted was to truly see me in the mirror. Maybe some of those little other little girls that I knew and others like them throughout the country that were growing up at that time could also see themselves in the mirror and realize that the mirror that was being held up to them was false and reflected somebody else's reality of who they were. I knew I had to wear, bear witness to my own truths, remembers Childs. The genre of musical theater, with its ability to communicate storytelling and emotional depth through words, music, movement, and spectacle, provided a means for which childs could bear witness to the perils and possibilities of black girlhood and further social justice. So just as black girlhood intersects multiple fields of intellectual query, so too must my study. My book, Black Girlhood on the Musical Stage, examines the critical tension between black women's representations of black girlhood, social activism, spectatorship, and popular entertainment. I ask the following questions throughout the study. How have black women artists, including writers, composers, directors, producers, and performers, contributed to the development of politically engaged popular entertainment on the contemporary musical stage? How does their work represent black girlhood? Does their artistry contradict, complicate, or critique dominant society's representations of black girlhood? And finally, how might spectators engage with musical theater productions created by black women artists? So within the past 50 years, yes, I'm, I'm going past 50 years, only a select few black women have been granted entree into elite white male circles of Broadway and break, albeit briefly, racial and gender barriers. For example, 
Urban Arts core founder Vanette Carroll became the first black woman to direct a Broadway musical with Mickey Grant's review, Don't Bother Me, I Can't Cope, in 1972. Carroll would also receive two Tony Award nominations for Best Direction of a Musical, the first African-American woman to do so. Producer and theater founder Rosetta Lenore championed diversifying casting on Broadway stages, stages, providing space for talented actors, regardless of their race, to cultivate their talents at her Amos Repertory Theater Company. Perhaps most notably, her collaboration with playwright Lofton Mitchell resulted in a 1976 Tony Award for their musical review, Bubbling Brown Sugar. Audra McDonald broke traditional casting practices playing Carrie Pipperidge in the 1994 Broadway review, uh, Broadway revival of Rodgers and Hammerstein's Carousel. McDonald's breakout role garnered her first of nine Tony Awards for Best Featured Actress in a Musical. Other greats include performers Debbie Allen, Leslie Ogums, and Felicia Rashad. And more recently, popular black women singers and entertainers such as Kiki Palmer, Nene Leakes, Raven Simone, Tony Braxton, Deborah Cox, Vanessa Williams, Viola Davis, and Fantasia Barino have also found opportunities to perform on Broadway stages. However, black women's greater visibility on Broadway stages does not extend to increased leadership opportunities off stage. In most cases, creative control remains out of reach for black women artists working on Broadway. This truth is exemplified by the fact that after Carol received a Tony nomination for Best Direction, it would take nearly 40 years for another black woman director to receive a similar nomination. So despite the commercial success of a few select black women musical theater artists, most black women achieve creative control of musical theater productions and acquire leadership positions in off-Broadway, regional theaters, community theaters, and touring companies. Challenged by sexism and racism, black women musical theater artists are all too often excluded from elite Broadway spaces and opt to showcase their talents in alternative spaces. In fact, some of the most successful contemporary black women musical theater artists have never written, composed, directed, produced, or performed on a Broadway stage. Yet artists such as Jackie Taylor, Duque Aramu and Vi Higginson are well respected within their communities in garnering national and international reputations for their work. For example, Higginson and her husband Ken Wydrew remember experiencing rejection by New York theater producers who doubted there was an audience for their gospel-based musical, Mama, I Want to Sing. Rather than accept defeat, they used their own funds to produce and tour the musical across the United States, Japan, and Europe. Within three years of its debut, Mama I Want to Sing garnered three million spectators and grossed $62.3 million. And this is in 1983, from 83 to 86. So think about what that really means in our time, how much money it grossed. So in addition to this long celebrated musical, which continues to tour, Taylor's The Other Cinderella and Aramu's The Liberation of Mother Goose remain a popular draw for predominantly black audiences throughout Chicago and New York, respectively. So unfortunately, musicals created by black women are rarely, if ever, included in musical theater scholarship. For example, Alan Wool's Black Musical Theater, From Coontown to Dreamgirls, published in 1989, is one of the most comprehensive histories of black musical theater. It does not even reference the hit Mama, I Want to Sing. Instead, he positions the smashing success of shows such as Pearly, Raisin, The Wiz, and Dream Girls as the, quote, culmination of 90 years of black experience on Broadway. So while Wool's study recovers the presence of early black talent on the Great White Way, his Broadway-centric focus does not attend to the wealth of black artistry created beyond Broadway. Nonetheless, my study owes a debt of gratitude to Wool's recuperative scholarship and ongoing efforts to reclaim early black musical theater artists. So we are gonna center black girls. My project privileges the artistry of contemporary black women musical theater artists, all of whom contribute to the creation of complex, multidimensional images of black girlhood. Ruth Nicole Brown defines black girlhood as, quote, the representations, memories, and lived experiences of being and becoming a body marked as youthful, black, and female. Black girlhood is not dependent then on age, 
phys physical maturity, or any essential category of identity, end quote. Brown conceptualizes the transition of, from black girlhood to womanhood as complex, fluid, and liminal, uh, liminal site of possibilities. Building on Brown's scholarship, Dominique C. Hill also recognizes black girlhood's transgressive possibilities. As an advocate of both black girlhood and black queer resistance, Hill re-envisions a transgressive approach to black girlhood studies that values the wholeness of, idea, of identity. So welding the word black girl together allows the symbolic resistance to the fracturing of race and gender and the celebration of black girls' lives, stories, and bodies. Brown and Hill's formulations of black girlhood directly contradict stereotypes found within popular culture, the media, and political spheres, which render black girls pathologized, fractured, and devoid of humanity. Indeed, society is replete with images of black girls as loud, angry, disrespectful, aggressive, ignorant, hypersexual, and unattractive. Moreover, scholars and politicians have given more credence to these stereotypes by ignoring black girl resiliency and promoting research and dog whistle politics that fetishize behavior such as promiscuity and delinquency to support their own agendas. Keenly aware of the multidimensional lives of black girls, the importance of representation, and the need to exercise these wrong-headed notions of black girlhood, black women musical theater artists have crafted a body of works that reclaim the sanctity of black girlhood. Now, staking a claim to black girlhood is not an innocuous exercise for black women musical theater artists. It is an act of resistance to anti-blackness and violence. Childs, for example, conceptualizes her early experiences of black girl girlhood as a, quote, minefield. She remembers, quote, you navigated it with the conscious understanding that if you miscalculated even one step, it was going to be over for you. And you also understood that sooner or later, you were going to miscalculate a step. So all the little black girls that I knew were like soldiers in that army. That is what black girlhood means to me, end quote. Using war and minefields as a metaphor for black girlhood, Childs reinforces the reality that anti-blackness and violence, including poverty, incarceration, sexual assault, and white cultural hegemony, force black girls to take on adult concerns which they are often ill-prepared to navigate. If not negotiated with great care, these unforeseen hazards will result in psychological harm, physical injury, and actual death. Contemporary black musical theater artists uh, center these concerns and in so doing articulate important truths about black girlhood in the US. So now for this third part, we are talking about fairy tales, but I think that there's some heaviness to these fairy tales that I wanna make sure to foreground that. Yes, you're being entertained by them, but they're also saying something really heavy about black girlhood in the US. So I wanna take a closer look at one of my case studies. I wanna show you a trailer for the 2019 production of The Other Cinderella. It doesn't like me. Hold on a sec. There we go. I was so amazed that they were able to get so many people on that stage dancing. I was a little bit worried for them at one point. But Jackie Taylor, she wrote, directed, and produced The Other Cinderella during a cultural flourishing known as the Black Arts Movement. This is from about 1965 to 1976. 
thousands of black artists across the United States and abroad advanced a cultural revolution capable of destroying institutional white racism, meaning the systems of oppression that dehumanize, criminalize, exploit, and ultimately kill black people. Okay? So fostering the black aesthetic was seen as critical to advancing this cultural revolution. The black arts movement theorist Larry Neal discusses the importance of the black aesthetic in his seminal article, The Black Arts Movement, published in 1968. He writes, the black aesthetic consists of an African-American cultural tradition, but this aesthetic is finally, by implication, broader than that tradition. It encompasses most of the usable elements of third world culture. The motive behind the black aesthetic is the destruction of the white thing, the destruction of white ideas, and white ways of looking at the world. Okay, so they're trying to put forth this different vision that hadn't been really put forth before, that was always existed, but that they wanted to celebrate it and amplify it. So Taylor, along with other black women intellectuals of the black arts movement, fostered the black aesthetic through a radical reevaluation of the Western fairy tale canon. As, black, as a black radical thinker, Taylor understood that many of these so-called classic European fairy tales actually originated within African folktale tradition. As a revolutionary artist, Taylor crafted works that reclaimed black uh, African diasporic traditions while also celebrating black girls' lives. Her popular musical, The Other Cinderella, which you heard everyone must see, um, exemplifies this approach allowing audiences to view the richness of black culture through the eyes of a resilient black girl protagonist. So Taylor understood the importance of fairy tales in black girls' lives. And by fairy tale, I refer to this subgenre of folklore that entails, quote, dark stories of violence, hardship, and strife, and contain magic and wish fulfillment, and offer the promise of victory over villainy, end quote. Black women intellectuals have long understood that fairy tales are more than made up stories meant to entertain children. As one of the oldest forms of communication, storytelling has helped transmit values, beliefs, and cultural mores of pre-literate societies. However, fairy tales take on special meaning for black girls who from an early age must navigate violence in their everyday lives. And this violence takes many different forms, including denying black girls access to essential an essential human habitat, meaning clean air, shelter, food, and water. It involves policing their speech, their bodies, and their behavior, and socializing them to believe in their own inferiority. These and other forms of violence negatively impact the physical, psychological, and economic well-being of black girls. Black women intellectuals recognize that popular European fairy tales, such as in European scare quotes, such as Snow White, um, which celebrate alabaster skin and other markers of white feminine beauty could harm black girls. Yet if radicalized, these same fairy tales have the potential to create new images of black girl joy, resilience, and victory over their seemingly more powerful adversaries. Taylor's critique of Western fairy tales parallels conversations that were happening within feminist fairy tale studies during the 1970s. Sparked by Alison Lurie's article, Fairy Tale Liberation, published in 1970, feminists launched critical debates about the role of fairy tales, positioning the promise of happily ever after within the larger cultural and political struggle for gender equality. However, these early feminist critiques focused on depictions of fairy tale heroines and limited the scope of their analysis to European and Anglo-American texts and writers. For example, Donald Hayes, his collection Fairy Tales and Feminism, New Approaches, offers one of the first studies to explore the reception of fairy tales, including those beyond the borders of German, French, and English-speaking countries. This was published in 2004 to give you a sense of where we're at. House he, uh, House, he writes that, quote, it is time for scholars to assess the impact of feminism and feminist criticism itself on the way contemporary readers experience fairy tales and expand the focus of feminist fairy tale research beyond Western European and Anglo-American tradition, and even within those traditions to investigate the fairy tale intertext in the work of minority writers and performers, end quote. Unfortunately, fairy tales created by black women and the socio-political meaning spectators garner from their works have yet to receive sustained study by feminist fairy tale scholars. So it's, it's important to note though that the Cinderella tale has been told thousands of times across many, many different cultures and continents. 
However, early anthropologists and folklorists focused on European tales and ignored African variants. They did more than ignore, I'll get to that. Uh, the marginalization of African variants was due to prejudice within the fields of anthropology and folklore studies and anti-blackness within greater society. Deborah L. Thompson writes that the leading 19th century folklorists, Joseph Jacobs and Andrew Ling, quote, presented arguments as to whether savages, the term both used to refer to Africans, or Red Indians, also their term, could produce such a tale as Cinderella and her glass slipper. Jacobs thought no, because at the heart of the story were marriage rituals established during feudal and medieval times. Lang, on the other hand, thought Cinderella could not have evolved from, quote, a naked, shoeless race, end quote. These wrong-headed and racist beliefs led early compilers to advance three European Cinderella tales. Here they are right here, the cat Cinderella, Cinderella or the glass slipper, and Aschenputtel. African variants were largely dismissed until around 1893. Although anthropologists and folklorists have since shifted away from Eurocentric visions of the Cinderella tale, even acknowledging that the oldest recorded Cinderella variant, Yanshin, originated, originated in 19th century China, she remains firmly fixed as a symbol of white feminine beauty within popular imagination. The popularity of Disney's cartoon Cinderella and Rodgers and Hammerstein's television production of Cinderella contribute to this image. In fact, Rodgers and Hammerstein Cinderella served as the catalyst for Taylor's own adaptation. During my 2020 interview with Taylor, she remembers that she wrote the other Cinderella as, quote, an experiment while teaching children at a difficult school, her words, in Chicago. She said, quote, well, well we can't do Cinderella. The children had just seen Rodgers and Hammerstein's version of Cinderella, and I said, we can do the other Cinderella. Let's make it relevant to who we are. That's how the other Cinderella was born. While Rogers and Hammerstein's television production may have sparked Taylor's interest in writing her own adaptation, she envisioned the other Cinderella as an outgrowth of the African storytelling tradition. And she writes in her program notes that, quote, the story of Cinderella originated as an African folktale. The universal message of the other Cinderella comes from fairy godmama, and it's fairy godmama, I like the way she spells it, fairy godmama, and I hope her words will be forever entrenched in your heart. Quote, you'll have a lifetime of hopes and dreams, of successes and failures in planning life schemes. There will always be heartaches that you must go through but you'll live through them all because of the spirit in you." End quote. The other Cinderella celebrates the spirit or the resilience of black girls. Taylor first directed and produced the other Cinderella at Black Ensemble Theater, the Chicago-based theater company which she founded in 1976. As an actress in her own right, Taylor later starred in the role of Cinderella to help increase interest in the musical. Her local celebrity, she had just appeared in the Hollywood film Cooley High, helped boost ticket sales. Taylor remembers that, quote, word of mouth is the best form of advertisement in the world. They kept coming. I could have just kept running it, but I was sick of it. People, sick of her own musical. I was sick of it. People loved the message. Find the greatness in yourself because it is there. No matter your circumstances, no matter what, it's there. Find it and use it. The other Cinderella, with its 40-year production history, remains a mainstay of the Black Ensemble Theater and continues to find success with Chicago audiences. So let's talk about the other Cinderella. The other Cinderella takes place in the kingdom of other, ruled by black royalty. We have King Harry, Queen Mildred, and their son, Prince Charles. The audience quickly learns that speculation about Prince's sexuality abounds throughout the kingdom. Indeed, Prince's friendship with an openly gay young man known simply as the Duke's son has caused quite a stir, and King vows to put an end to these rumors, as well as instill a sense of responsibility into his son by decreeing a royal ball. King sends invitations to women throughout the land and orders Prince to select a wife. Having established the musical's premise, Taylor then introduces audiences to Cinderella, an orphaned black girl who suffers abuse from stepmama and her stepsisters, Geneva and Marguerite. 
While Cinderella expresses a desire to leave her toxic home environment, she does not take action because she believes she can't secure a job without her high school diploma. However, a fairy godmama who practices voodoo sees her worth and encourages her to attend the ball, providing her with a dress, transportation, and dancing lessons. As with the classic fairy tale, Cinderella and Prince fall in love at the ball, and her abrupt departure leaves behind, and in her abrupt departure leaves behind a glass slipper or shoe. After a search throughout the kingdom for the owner of the glass shoe, Prince arrives at Cinderella's home. However, unlike the other Cinderella tales, Geneva, her, her stepsister, actually tries on the shoe, and it fits her perfectly, and the audience is like, ah! Oh! that can't be. Um, Fairy Godmama, though, she returns and she threatens harm to, to Cinderella's family if they continue interfering with the story. And she uses her magical powers to confine like the family onto the couch so they can't move. So at last, Cinderella tries on the shoe if it's perfectly, and the couple agree to get married and they live happily ever after, right? As you can probably tell by this plot summary, Taylor includes many of the motifs audiences would expect from a Cinderella variant. Thompson defines a motif as a repeated element common among folk tales, such as a magic mirror, incantations, formulaic beginnings, such as once upon a time, and formulaic endings, and they lived happily ever after. Thompson writes that within the Cinderella tale, 21 common motifs emerge. Don't worry, we're not gonna go through all of these, but 21 common motifs emerge. I wanna point out a couple persecuted, abused heroine, check. Cruel stepmother and stepsisters, check. Deceased father, check. Supernatural helper, in this case a fairy godmama, she's there, check. And clothes produced by magic, check. So she fits a lot of these, these motifs in the, in the musical. However, Taylor also includes critical departures that make her tale unique. Thompson writes that, quote, no matter from which continent or culture the tale evolved, each Cinderella tale is unique shaped by large-scale cultural, political, and historical influences such as invasion, colonization, and migration, end quote. Taylor's tale is shaped by her experiential knowledge of growing up in Chicago projects and navigating the pervasiveness of racism. Taylor remembers, quote, the kingdom is a reflection of my reality, of the people who I know. You can only write about what you know. The brothers from the hood were a very strong part of my community. So of course they would be in the kingdom of other. And she does that, she includes these brothers in her tale. There they are right there. You saw them in the clip too. So these brothers, they take the form of these side characters, Paige, Groundhog, Peanut Butter, and Pee Wee. And I actually have a cousin named Pee Wee, that's his nickname, so this really like resonated with me. We've got, and my nickname is Pie, so like food names, this resonated with me. So they, they come out of the audience. So imagine you're sitting here, Characters come from, they're sitting along with you, they come out of the audience, and then they have direct address to the audience and they welcome you to the kingdom of other. And their welcome includes improvised flirtations with the women in the audience. That was really interesting watching that unfold. Um, they, they do that, they dance, and they sing a few bars from popular R&B and rap songs of today. So, Breaking down these traditional barriers between performer and audience, as well as use the use of familiar music, promoted a spirit of celebration and community during the production. And these sentiments are in keeping with Taylor's own artistic mission, which is to eradicate the pain and suffering caused by anti-blackness and all forms of racism. Taylor reflects, quote, we are highly segregated in Chicago. Chicago is a very racist city. The systems that are here are at the core based on a highly racist attitude of white supremacy. And we need to stop this nonsense, period. Taylor's use of black cultural references stands out as another critical departure. I witnessed a production on November 15th, 2019, just months before the onslaught of COVID-19, which resulted in the closure of theaters throughout the world. And it's a good thing that I was able to see this performance because Taylor has no plans to publish this work. On the night I attended, the cast performed to a full house of, in a 299 seat theater, so about double the size of this space right here. And the vast majority of the spectators were black and about 10% were from other races. 
The other Cinderella, though, is designed to appeal to the sensibilities of black audiences, allies who are in the know, as well as those who have yet to gain a deep commitment to racial ju uh, justice. So she's able to cross all of these demographics. And she does so by employing audience engagement, which I spoke about. She used call and response between performers and audiences. She used pop cultural references. I heard a lot about Beyonce during this production, more than I thought I would hear. She mentioned uh, Idris Elba, Michael B. Jordan, uh, food selection, and singing tasks. You'll remember the other slide, that's actually a motif that you usually find in Cinderella Tales, but hers is a little bit different. She puts her own spin on it in that she, the task is, involves traditional Southern cooking, and music. And what I mean by that is there is a character named Dorothy. She's the only white character in the play. She's not a citizen of the kingdom of other, but she wants to belong. She just loves this place and she wants to be a citizen. So the king says, okay, I give you three tests. If you pass the test, you get to be a citizen of the kingdom of other. The first test is she must try watermelon. And at first I thought, oh no, is Jackie Taylor using stereotypes? And in some ways she's saying, well, all people like watermelon. So Dorothy tries it and she's like, this is delicious. And then she has uh, Dorothy try colored greens, and there's three different kinds of greens on the table. And Dorothy says, I can't eat this. And they're like, she doesn't want to be a citizen. And she's like, no, 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 I can't eat it without cornbread. And they're like, huzzah, you pass. And then the third test is she has to sing the blues. And at first, people started laughing at her in the audience, like, this, this white girl ain't going to be able to sing the blues, right? Sister sang the blues, she sang and she sang. By the end of her rendition, the audience was on its feet clapping and like with her all the way. So she's able to, to now become a citizen in the kingdom of other. And this is a moment where she's trying to show the fact that black and white people can live in harmony and that it's important and it's enriching for everyone involved. She also shows black royalty, this idea that everyday black folks have a history of royalty. Despite colonization and efforts to disconnect us from this past, it exists. She also delves into colorism within the black community. There's a subplot of the king's attendant and the queen's lady in waiting that are in love with each other, but they feel like they can't be together because he's dark skinned and she's light skinned. Lots of singing ensues, lots more singing ensues, and then they realize we can totally be together. So they end up together. She also critiques classism. This idea that Cinderella's stepsisters, they belittle her by referring to the fact that she was quote, born in the projects. And Cinderella responds by saying, Lots of people are born in the projects, and she says so without shame. Taylor states the quote, it's classism that we have to stop. The we meaning classism within black communities. So she's talking to black communities, but she's also addressing those outside of those communities. And then the last thing I'll, I'll point out before I end is that Taylor centers black girlhood, and in so doing critiques the lack of care and opportunities afforded black girls. So stepmama, she disparages Cinderella and curtails her desire for autonomy, even removing her from public schools. Throughout the musical, stepmama constantly tells Cinderella that she's, quote, just too stupid to learn, and first forces her to work as a domestic servant in her own home and refuses to let her attend the royal ball. As a result, Cinderella is left feeling unloved in her household, but she also lacks the resources to move out on her own. Her family, community, and society at large have almost written her off. While Cinderella bears both emotional scars and literal scars on her legs in the production, through this abuse, she somehow manages to remain resilient. She continues to speak her mind and keep her head high. Actress Jayla Williams Craig, who performed this role, perceives this as an important aspect of black girlhood. And during our, two, our 2021 interview, Jayla said, quote, black girlhood is empowerment, confidence, strength, and togetherness. I think that we as black girls are inspiration, not only just for other races and other types of people, but for each other as well. We have to build each other up in order to be the successful people we are, which is what makes us gain our confidence in ourselves. This world is very tough on us. There's lots of pressure on us, and we have to show the world that we're stronger than they already think we are. Cinderella embodies this black girl strength, but even so, she is still in desperate need of encouragement and opportunities. Fairy Godmama provides these vital resources, allowing her to have her happily ever after with the prince. However, all black girls need encouragement and opportunities, and fairy godmamas are in short supply. Black girls also need more representation of their complex and three-dimensional lives. 
Williams Craig believes, and I do too, that her portrayal of Cinderella helps fill this void. And as such, I'm going to just end with a quote about her take on the other Cinderella. And she says, the show is black. We have black royalty, black jobs, and black cultural references or black Easter eggs within the show that only black people would understand or relate to. I think that's the point that Jackie Taylor went for. She's like, I want a story of the black Cinderella, her circumstances and her lifestyle and what she would be going through. She knew her audiences would be black and understand and relate. And then she started crying and said, I, I want to cry because experiencing the, the girls who would experience the show would come up to me after the performance. The little girls made me feel so good about what I did. They rarely see that, so the production was very special to me. To me, to show them that we can do this too. We have our own story, and we can always have our own story. We just have to have those opportunities. If the door is closed, how can we get in? Thank you. So now um, we have a Q&A, which I'm going to moderate. So um, how, about how many minutes do we have? We have about 10 minutes for a Q&A. So what questions do you have or thoughts? And if you saw the other Cinderella, I would love to hear your, your thoughts. Were you going to raise your hand? Yeah. I do have a question. Yeah. Uh, and with, especially with COVID and theater not Thanks. a big opportunity, I was curious what fairy tales or children's books in general have you read with your daughter that embodies these kinds of messages? What, what books have I read and, and, and fairy tales that, that I read with my own daughter? Oh my gosh. Oh, there we, we recently, it's not a book, but it's a, it's a, it's a film, it's a short, that, that short, um, that Disney short about hair. That one is one of, do you all know the one I'm talking about? The mother has cancer and they go in. So we, we've read other books about hair, but for me, raising a, a black girl, it was so important that she have confidence in herself and stories about hair, even though it may seem like it's not a big deal. Hair is a big part of our lives. And so we have those moments where we connect by reading books about hair, watching shows about hair, and literally doing our hair. So I would say for me, that's, that's been golden, teaching her that. My daughter is also biracial, and so that throws in other conversations to be had regarding hair and the different hair types within our own family as well. Yeah. But thank you. And we've also read some of the Brothers Grimm's as well, and they're much darker than you would think. Chopping off feet, all of that. And we realize maybe we'll stay away from that for a little bit. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Do you see any other um, fairy tales as maybe the basis for a, a production, either a film or a live theater? Other than the other Cinderella, anything that you feel would make a good outlet for the things that have come out of the other Cinderella? Yeah, like for me, I didn't uh, have the, the opportunity to talk about this, but for me, Snow White. Snow White has always, from a very young age, when I would hear that story, it just made me feel like I was ugly. And I know that I wasn't the only one. Other black girls in my class felt the same way. This idea that somehow she's beautiful because she's white. So it automatically translates darkness ugly, right? And then it's reinforced within society as a whole. And so when I went to college as an undergrad, I was in this theater making class. It was a theater for young audiences class. And we had to find, this is how I got into fairy tales. We had to like pick a fairy tale, perform it, to schools across Oregon, like in very rural pockets of Oregon. That was what we were meant to do. And so we gathered, there were about 10 of us students, we sat and we had to pick a fairy tale, like which one do we think will be like the most meaningful to do? So similar to your question. And different fairy tales were thrown up and, and someone said Snow White and everyone latched onto that. Yes, Snow White, there's, we can have our seven dwarves, we can have our witch or, you know, Snow White, there's, this is a perfect cast size. And I remember sitting there and just feeling, this is so gross, I cannot be a part of this. And I very hesitantly raised my hand and just said, I really don't wanna do Snow White. And they said, well, why not? Why don't you wanna do this? And it was one of those moments where I thought like, 
Ugh, I, I'm going to have to disclose something that's very personal to me, how it makes me feel. And they might reject that. They might say, oh, you need to suck it up it's, or made some excuses for it and what have you. But I decided I'm going to share with them what Snow White meant to me. And as I shared what it meant to me and how it made me feel, the other students in the class said, well, now we have to do it, LaDonna. And my, my, everything just dropped. And they said, no, 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 you're Snow White. Would you be willing to play Snow White? Because what you're telling us is that there are little girls out there, little black girls, who hear that story and feel sadness about who they are. You can be that positive representation. And so we did our own adaptation of Snow White, and I played Snow White, and I tried telling them, no, this isn't about me, and they're like, no, you're Snow White. So I played Snow White, and we toured it. And there were some kids in the audience who were like, she not Snow White. But the, va the vast majority of them were like, OK, cool. Yeah, she's Snow White, right? So I think stories like that that we do find problematic, we can, if it's appropriate, we can do our own radical take on it. And that's what we did. We toured that show. So for me, Snow White is something that I would love to see done in a very different way. It's a long-winded answer, but I love that question. And also, did you like the quotes from Jackie Taylor? She's very strong. She has strong opinions, right? She just flat out said, Chicago is racist. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to put this in a book, right? But she's just, she's telling you like it is. And she formed that theater. I didn't mention this. In, in 1976, and she had just done Kulia High. She had just given birth to her first child. And she founds the theater. She uses her own savings, a few thousand dollars, and tries to get a loan from banks as well. And back in the 70s, it was very difficult for a black woman entrepreneur to go into a bank and get a loan, right? But she was able to do that and found her own theater company from 1976, and it's still around today. I just think, how incredible is that to have that long of a history of a theater? Most theaters close within a year. She's been around that long. And part of it is due to word of mouth. The community really supports her theater. And when I spoke with her, though, I did ask her, OK, have you ever wanted to direct something on Broadway? I had to ask, like, you're amazing. Does, do you have an interest in that? And she said, no. I have no interest in putting up $10 million to produce a play on Broadway when my audience is here. My audience is the black community and allies that live in Chicago. That's how she envisioned her theater. She wants to do good in the world. She wants a place where people can come together and explore these topics. And the same spectators come again and again. So they literally form a community. People who had seen that, other Cinderella, had seen it maybe four times before. So it really fosters community. Any other questions? I know I just like babbled about that. I just wanted to share that. Yeah. Um, I have a question. I'm not sure if I will frame this up very articulately. But I find it fascinating, some points you're making about, and I'm, I'm trying to decide what is um, most helpful for harmony and what's not, is these audiences. And we tend to have, like children's books, that, you know, if it's a main protagonist is a, is a girl, boys won't read that, they need a book with a boy protagonist. Yes. After, you know, you're saying in these communities of Chicago where she, she's happy that she has her neighborhood audience, and I live north of Chicago, and we, we wish we had more, you know, quality theater and it's, it seems to be geographical and people stay in their little, their neighborhoods and, and in, thank goodness for Hamilton, some people break that out and cha Hamilton changes. Um, but if we want to have, if the goal is harmony, um, do you see any change happening and maybe, you know, there's, there's room for both that does harmony happen if we do break down those neighborhoods and, those, and mix up those audiences, whether it's in books, I feel sometimes narrow audience ideals, like on the internet, we know it doesn't foster wise beliefs. Absolutely, you're just talking to the same, it's yeah. preaching to the choir, right, so that whole idea. Theater, is mm -hmm. this an issue at all? Well, I would say, hmm, how to best tackle that? So her initial idea was that she said she wanted to bring black audiences to black ensemble theater, but she also wanted to have white audience members and members from other communities as well. That was very important to her. So while it, she wanted it to be this space for black creative artists, Everyone was welcome. So when she first started, she had that idea. And then she noticed, there are only black audiences here. So I'm really like preaching to the choir. Like, we're not doing anything. We're talking to people who are already on board. How do we reach people who are not on board, but people who maybe have an open mind? And that is actually, she, she decided, 
music. Music is universal. It crosses, like, in, tens, in terms of how much we love music. Music crosses all cultures, all demographics. And she realized, music, I can bring them in through good music. And that's when she had the idea, musicals, all in musicals. And so that's what she's been able to do. Now, in terms of, like, Broadway stages right now, we're having these discussions about how to make Broadway more diverse, more equitable, both on stage and off, right? That, that call has been for, put forward with that manifesto, we see you white American theater. And so it challenged that manifesto, Broadway theaters to make, to change things, to like really shake things up, to not just go through COVID and have all the theaters close and then come back and do the same stuff all over again, right? So a lot of theaters put out these statements saying we support it, we're gonna do it, yada, yada, yada. Then after COVID happened, it opens, what shows do we see on Broadway coming back? The Music Man, like we're, we're, still, we're still seeing some of these things. However, there are, I believe, five or six new shows written by black playwrights appearing on Broadway. But I also want to know, I'm always like, yes, and. OK, so now you have playwrights in the room. That's great. But what about directors? What about lighting designers, costume design? We need to change all of these elements, especially costume design, where you have people working and working with hair. Like We need those artists to be in the room. So I think that demand for change, it's ongoing. It's continuous. We can't just use this moment of like, oh, t summer of 2020, this is happening, and then just let it go away, if that makes sense. Like, it, it does, because I really respect what she's doing, because if you start with ticket sales first, then you have to please that overall audience, follow the money, right? She starts with a genuine story in the neighborhood, and then if it picks up, right? Yeah. And we hope, you know, we hope it does, and we can vote with our dollars and our feet. But, Absolutely. But, slow, yeah. but for me, like, I just think that women like her are doing this amazing work, and it's not being acknowledged or celebrated, and I think it's such a tragedy that they're not getting the respect and the recognition that they so deserve. Even producers like Woody King, I didn't have time to talk about him. Woody King is this, he's like, if you wanna talk about black theater producers, Woody King, people call him the kingmaker, okay? He's the kingmaker. The kingmaker in New York, he's been doing plays for so long and has never received recognition. He was the first person producer to take Endazaki Shange's play for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow was enough, to mount that, and then it moved on to Broadway. But it was this story about these black girls, and he said, huh, that's meaningful, let's do it. Then Broadway picked it up, but that's very rare for that to happen. So he's been doing that for 40 plus years, doing all of these amazing works. Just now he received an honorary Tony for his work. After a lifetime of doing incredible work. So, we are seeing that recognition happening, but I'm a little bit hesitant to know, to think how long-term it's going to be. I'm a little bit suspicious, like a little hesitant to, to believe, yeah. Thank you for your question. We're, at, we're okay. Well, if there aren't any more questions, we're gonna wrap up. And thank you all for being the best audience uh, this black girl could ever hope for. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.